ضخم تبدو اثاره وانفجار ثاني وانفجارات كبيره وهائله ربما هذا ما اشار له المسؤول العسكري American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed.
يبشر الأمة بتشكيل مجلس شورى المجاهدين في العراق والذي سيكون بحول الله وقوته نواة لقيام دولة إسلامية تكون فيها كلمة الله هي العليا And it is true that much of the intelligence turned out to be wrong. As president, I am responsible for the decision to go into Iraq. also reassess how black water not only affects our mission in Iraq, but also how it may negatively affect our foreign relations efforts in the Middle East. To uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. وهي صواريخ تنطلق من رؤية في شهران لا نريد أن نتحدث Beneath all of this, emergency teams raced across the city. Yes, among the thousands of U.S. troops from Georgia's Fort Stewart and Fort Benning was an Army specialist with a camcorder. The video, shot by an infantryman, was from inside a Bradley fighting vehicle in Kuwait, just across the border from Iraq, moments after President George W. Bush ordered an invasion. How do you feel about the situation at hand? I'm ready to go. Let's go. 
Let's get this stuff done, over with. Yeah. Man, I feel real good, you know, man. Let's talk about it, man. man you know when the boys start running. As you see, field artillery has gone wild also. It going wild on Rocky's. Artillery launched within minutes. As soon as he gave the order, they were firing. We were firing. Johnny Grimes was 22, a comms specialist assigned to roll in a Bradley, as was his buddy, Brandon Watts. Atlanta, Georgia. Four, four. ATL. 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 Stuck in a Bradley. So you're in this tin can waiting for the ramp to drop. When the ramp of a Bradley drops, troops emerge in what they call battle rattle. We are in Iraq. This is Iraq right here. We're in this little position right here. Enemies all around us somewhere. Watts says the first days of the invasion were comparatively quiet until they got to the Euphrates River and then the airport in Baghdad. That first round went off and hit that tank, I was, or hit that truck, I was looking right at it, and it turned night to day instantly. It was deadly and at times grisly. The convoy had stopped and the war got frightening. That one was close and personal, the airport. You're all within 50 yards. I don't know, that's, that's a different animal. Watts and Grimes were on hand when a large statue of Saddam Hussein toppled. At that early moment, it seemed prematurely that the invasion had succeeded. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media. This is Yeshayahu, where we bring you the gospel of Yahusha HaMashiach, 
Jesus the Christ to address the problems of a modern world. And today's topic, shock and awe, whirlwind from the north, Operation Mayhem Part 8, King of the North, King of the South. For Ezra, Chapter 11, then I heard a voice saying to me, look in front of you and consider what you see. When I looked, I saw what seemed to be a lion roused from the forest, roaring, and I heard how it uttered a human voice to the eagle, and spake, saying, Listen, and I will speak to you. The Most High says to you, Are you not the one that remains of the four beasts that I had made to reign in my world, so that the end of my times might come through them? You, the fourth that has come, have conquered all the beasts that have gone before, and you have held sway over the world with great terror and over the earth with grievous oppression. King of the North. So we're back in uh, Daniel chapter 11 again. And I'm um, trying to bring to light these prophecies, which were of old, um, and they seem to keep repeating. The, the script is the same. The players may have changed, but the actual, uh, the actual outcomes are kind of the same. So how does, how does that come about? So if we read Daniel chapter 11, and verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. Now, he's speaking in a time where he's prophesying of the coming of essentially uh, the kingdom of Alexander the Greek. And, uh, Alexander, he, he only lived to be about 33 years old and he died and bequeathed the remainder of his kingdom, a very large kingdom, to his four generals. But the scriptures only talk about the two, and, it, and the scriptures call them the two kings. Um, and essentially, it, it came down to the Seleucus Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire. Um, the other two portions, remember I said it was divided into four parts amongst the four generals, but the other two are non-players in the large scheme of thing, things. And uh, that's, there's a reason for that. Now, we, we have to look into the spirit. You know, those who worship must worship in spirit and truth. Well, in the spirit of things, we got to understand that there are spiritual principalities at work here. So actually, when the scriptures talk about the king of the north and the king of the south, they're really talking about entities, really talking about uh, what Paul described as uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, uh, principalities, rulers of the darkness. He's, he's talking about uh, spirit beings and where these spirit beings come from. You know, we tend to use the terminology angels. Um, I don't like that terminology. We overuse it. Angel simply means messenger, right? But what kind of messenger? Uh, A man can be a messenger, which would (laughs) make him an angel, right? But these spiritual powers, for instance, the prince of Persia, prince as a principality, withstood Michael, the archangel, what we call an archangel, right? Withstood him. And Michael is called the prince that standeth for the children of Israel, right? So these principalities are real things. And it seems that they have regional uh, overlordship. So even though the players, the human players may change, the king of the north is still this principality that governs over that region. Now, I'm not sure that that region hasn't expanded and it can't expand, but 
Um, I tend to think it can, but for the most part, the King of the North is a principality, a, a, an Elohim. And I know that might freak you out if you understand Elo, Elohim simply means mighty one, the mighty ones. Um, but that's what scriptures, when you go back to the original Hebrew, that's what they are called. And oftentimes uh, they're called living creatures, which indicates something that's alive that was created. So these are created Elohim. And I'm going to do a video do a little more in depth on that. So the king of the north is a created being, a principality, and the king of the south is a principality. And so Daniel is speaking to these things, right? Um, so at the time Daniel was writing this, it was about two, uh, two, three hundred years before the rise of Alexander the Greek and the uh, the establishment of the Greco-Macedonian Empire and the division in four parts and then two of those kings and they're the, they're the ones called kings not the other two only two of them are called kings um, they start going at it because you know greed is greed right <laughs> the king of the north wants to to take over the king of the south and make one big empire and the king of the south he wants to take over the king of the north and make one big empire but they're kind of equally matched and they can never actually gain ground on one another but caught in the middle of this this back and forth i mean directly in the middle of it there in fact they're a highway between the two armies is palestine and so it's a it must have been a miserable existence for a while but there you have uh judah or you know the, the remnant that returned back from uh persian captivity uh, really, the Babylonian captivity, Persia just you know, knocked the, the Babylonians off their pedestal. But um, the Persians were actually kind of uh, amenable, affable, and they got along quite famously with the, the Yahudim, the Jews, and allowed them to go back and reestablish the walls and the temple. So yeah, there's a decent relationship there, a uh, very liberal relationship. So the Jews are back in Palestine, and here comes Alexander the Great, who overthrows the Persians. Oh, great. So just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, here comes a new world ruling kingdom that you don't have a relationship with. So anyway, the Seleucid Empire is the king of the north, or I should say the king of the north uses, utilizes the king, the Seleucid uh, Empire. And Seleucus comes to power, so he, it becomes known as the Seleucid Empire. But the king of the south is, the, is Ptolemy, um, and the king of the south uses Ptolemy, the, the human beings that make up that empire, um, as his uh, launch pad. So the king of the north and the king of the south are kind of going at it for territory. Just keep in mind, two principalities using human beings. And uh, so they go back and forth. But the king of the north, uh, he comes down and he, he conquers and he pillages and it looks like he has the upper hand. But uh, as we see in Daniel chapter 11, in verse 40, and at that time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the, the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So, that happened at the time of uh, the the. Greco-Macedonian Empire. And so uh, 
Um, the king of the south pushed back against the king of the north and regained territory. But then the king of the north came back like a whirlwind and took back territories. So like I say, it was a back and forth thing. Um, and any, the history book I used in college, it's funny, we'll talk about these things in detail. I mean, it goes back and forth. It names names and it fits right into this narrative. But it says here, and at the time of the end. So it seems as though, there's an old saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. It means the faces have changed, the players have changed, and the names of the countries changed, but they essentially act out the same script. And so fast forward to the end times, what do we see? What we see at World War I, the Ottoman Turks had an empire and it was predominantly Islamic, Muslim, right? And they ruled that area, the area that kind of is being talked about here, as king of the south, you know, Egypt into the Middle East and on, you know, and I don't like that term Middle East, there's no such thing. It was invented in about the year 1920 by some English guy. So there's really no such thing as a Middle East. So get that out of your head. I know, I know you've been brainwashed with that. But we're talking about Northeast Africa. That's what we're really talking about. But, but for some reason, you know, they dug the Suez Canal and separated the, the land mass. And so they started calling it the Middle East. Not Northeast Africa, but now it's the Middle East. So that's a fallacy. Um, those areas have the same flora and fauna. They originally had the same animals, if you go back far enough. Um, they're on the same tectonic plate as Africa. It's Northeast Africa is what it is. So I digress. But <laughs> anyway, um, so you, know, you fast forward to World War I and the same type of thing happens. The Ottoman Turks and their empire this plays the role of king of the south. So the, the entity the principality known as the King of the South rules over this Ottoman Turkish Empire and guides them. But now who's King of the North at the time of World War I? Well, King of the North at that time would be Great Britain. And so Great Britain comes down and defeats the Ottoman Turks, you know, with the, with the help of the Americans, of course, and their allies. But the British come in like a whirlwind into Palestine and they seed over or deed over Palestine to a certain family uh, by way of the Balfour de Declaration. So think about it. You got people living in Palestine, have no clue what's about to happen to them. Uh, their land is on paper been taken away from them and given to a very wealthy European family. Literally. So you look that up, Balfour Declaration. And that family um, had a plan. We won't go into it because I don't want to get uh, cut off here. You know, I don't want my video to get shot down. But if you see how the whole thing plays out, you'll, you'll understand the plan. You just have to look at what happens after this Balfour Declaration, and you'll see the plan. And so the King of the North... Great Britain and, and her allies come into Palestine and plant themselves between the seas in the Holy Land, essentially. And they cede it over to this family. Well, let's fast forward some more. And this is the crux of this video is that we, we look at uh, what happened at 9-11. Again, it's the king of the south pushing at the king of the north. So there's a new sheriff in town, and it's called the United States of America and her allies. So it's, it's just power being these principalities giving power to, to nations, uh, but it's still the king of the north giving power now, taking it from the British and giving it to the Americans. And so we see the king of the south, still Islam. It's no longer the Ottoman Turkish Empire, but they still kind of act as one pushing 
against the king of the north, in this case, the United States. And so again, here we go again, the United States, the king of the north, comes in like a whirlwind with shock and awe. And we see the whole thing play out again. Now this might be the final iteration, or there may be one more iteration of it. We shall see. Um, but they, they keep doing the same thing. They keep playing the same script over and over because the principalities are the same. These created beings are the same. They're just doing the same things they've always been doing. The human beings have come and gone because, of course, we only have a finite lifespan. But the principalities driving these power plays are the same. The same guys, the same principalities that drove Alexander the Great and drove the Roman Empire and, and you know, the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire. These are the same principalities, the same guys. They're just using the, these new, the players that exist at the time. So I don't know if there'll be another iteration of it, but this one was a really good one, um, this last iteration. So through terrorism, <laughs> um, the king of the south pushes at the king of the north, but then the king of the north comes in like a whirlwind. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are you, are you guys seeing? And I, I find it interesting that towards the end they mentioned Libya. Um, and Libyans are the descendants of uh, uh, put the son of Ham. Um, the Egyptians are the descendants of Mitzrayim, the son of Ham. And the Ethiopians, that's a, that's a, a Greco, that's a Hellenized word. Um, Egypt, Egypt, kind of named after the Aegean Sea which is actually named after an African king, and Janus, I believe, maybe I'm saying it wrong. Uh, read the book of Jasher because it talks all about this. Anyway, so Egypt uh, is, is basically, uh, the Hebrew word is Cush, or excuse me, Ethiopia, the Hebrew word is Cush. And so Cush, um, you can insert that word instead of Ethiopia. So, you know, take it, take it for what you will, but I say your best way of understanding the scriptures is to get back to the original Hebrew as much as possible. You remember Hebrew is written on several levels. You know, English is not, emphatically not. Uh, in Hebrew, every letter has a meaning. Every letter has a meaning. Not only a, an actual meaning, but an actual numerical value. That's something that a lot of people don't understand. Um, just like Roman numerals are really Roman letters in, in Latin, but they didn't have a, a number system, so they used their letters and gave their letters a numerical value. Well, they get that from Hebrew. So really, the Romans get it from the Greeks, and the Greeks get it from the Hebrews. And so there you have it. So we just, we're just seeing this whole thing play out again. The king of the north being pushed at by the king of the south and the king of the south uh, being overrun like a whirlwind by the king of the north. And so the question is, is there a, one last iteration? It, this could be the last iteration because it kind of fits. Um, the only thing I don't think, it, I, I'm not sure that it is because it says he will plant himself between the seas in I think in the Holy Land basically the British did that the Americans didn't really do that so maybe there's one more iteration of this just keep in mind the same principalities are struggling against each other for dominion and maybe it's not so much they're struggling against each other as they are basically um, trying to bring about the downfall of man and this is one of the methods they use. There, it, maybe the principalities are not against each other, you know, because a house divided shall not stand, right? You know that scripture. Um, and if Satan cast out Satan, how shall his kingdom stand, right? So maybe they're not so much going at each other as they're trying to uh, wholesale destroy as many human beings as possible through endless war. And maybe that's the, that, that actually makes sense. Endless war. Lots of death. So, 
In summary, we go Daniel 11 again, verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, meaning the king of the north. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy, and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. Uh Uh-huh, maybe that's yet to come. Uh, In the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. And when, when I read that, I keep thinking about the woman that rides the beast, how she's devoured and burned with fire. Um, Babylon is burned with fire. In one hour does her judgment come. So it just feels that way. It feels like they're connected. So if you do the math, there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. You just got to kind of put the equation, create an algebraic equation and solve for the other side of the uh, equal sign, right? For, for you mathematicians out there. But uh, that's kind of uh, what I wanted to discuss uh, on this video. Um, see if you see the parallels. And if you do, then I think uh, we can go forth and uh, draw some more conclusions. Well, family. Farewell, I love you all so much, and thank you so much for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell, and share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. I thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. I very much appreciate you all, and shout out to the channel members. And may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day who's in the body of Messiah, Yahusha HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I'll see you on the next video. Shalom.